Welcome, and thank you for joining today's NISPAC meeting. Let me now turn things over to Mr. Mark Bradley, the Director of the Information Security Oversight Office, as well as the Chairman of the NISPAC. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 65th meeting of the National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee, commonly known as the NISPAC. We appreciate your patience as we navigate through these difficult times. This is the second NISPAC meeting that's being conducted 100% virtually. At the conclusion, we will provide a survey to find out how this worked for everyone as we did for the last meeting. We've incorporated uh, the comments you were kind enough to send along last time. So again, if you have anything else we can do to improve, please let us know. If you'd like to uh, be contacted regarding survey responses, please include your email uh, in the comments box so we can get back to you personally. If you'd like uh, to receive information on future NISPAC meetings, my staff is no longer sending calendar invitations. You'll be able to get all the pertinent information about the coming, upcoming uh, NISPAC meetings by signing up the ISU overview blog or going to the Federal Register. Please send an email to NISPAC, that's N-I-S-P-P-A-C, at NARA.gov if there are any questions or any problems about accessing that. Like the available uh, agenda, slides, and biographies uh, can be retrieved by doing a Google search for NISPAC records on committee activities and clicking the first link. Again, do a Google search for NISPAC records on committee activities and click the first link. Not all speakers have slides or biographies. Uh, this meeting will be uh, through the phone line only. Uh, this is a public meeting, just like all our NISPAC meetings are, that will be recorded. Recording along with the transcript and minutes will be available within 90 days on the NISPAC reports on committee activities page I just mentioned. Um, we're planning on a five minute break uh, during the middle of, of the meeting, so uh, that's, uh, I will flag that as we move closer to that. Right, I'll begin at, uh, by taking attendance uh, for the meeting for the government members first. I'll state the name of the agency. The agency member will reply by identifying themselves. Once I've gone through the government members, I will then proceed with the industry members. After the industry members, I will then proceed to the speakers. Please keep your phone on mute until I have stated your agency. If you do not have a mute button, please hit star six on your phone to mute and unmute. As a reminder, NISPAC members, speakers, and I assume should have called on the speaker line, not the participant line. All right, so we're going to start with a, a roll call. I'll start with the ODNI. Who is uh, present for the ODNI? Hi, this is Kyla Power. All right. Welcome. You're replacing uh, Valerie Kerbin today, right? Yeah, unfortunately, Valerie wasn't able to make it today. Not a problem. Okay, thank you. DOD, who's representing you today? Good morning. This is Jeff Spinninger. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Very well, sir. Right. And you? Good. Uh, just like you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Department of Energy, who is representing you? Good morning. This is Tracy Kendall. Morning, Tracy. All right. NRC? Good morning. This is Chris Heilig. Hi, Cliff. DHS? Hey, good morning. This is uh, Rob McCray here. I am replacing uh, Mike Scott. Okay. Hi, Rob. Welcome. DCSA? Keith Miner. Good morning. Hey, hey Keith. Sheldon Salt. CIA? Okay. Again, please. CIA? Anyone from CIA on the phone call? All right. Apparently not. All right. Department of Commerce. All right, Department of uh, Justice. Good morning, it's Christine Gunning and Kathleen Barry. Hi, Christine, Kathleen. All right, it's NASA. Good morning, Ken Jones here. Morning. NSA, National Security Agency. Good morning, Shirley Brown. Hi, Shirley. All right, let me flip over here, hold on a second. Okay. Department of State. Uh, Kim Bogger, good morning. Morning. Department of Air Force. Jennifer Aquinas here from Air Force. Morning. 
from the Navy. Good morning, Randy Akers from Department of Navy. Hi, Randy. Department of the Army. Good morning, Jim Anderson, Department of the Army. Good morning, Jim. Uh, now I'm going to turn to the industry members. Uh, Heather Sims, are you present? Good morning, Heather Sims. All right. Dan McGarvey. Good morning. I'm here. Dennis Ariaga, are you here? Good morning, sir. Dennis Ariaga here. Great to hear from you, Dennis. Rosie Barrero. Good morning. Rosie Barrero here. Okay. Cheryl Stone. Yes, this is Cheryl Stone. Great. Hi, Cheryl. April Abbott. Yes. Good morning. April Abbott here. All right. Derek Jones. Good morning. Derek Jones is present. All right. Great. Tracy Durkin. Hi, good morning. Tracy Durkin is present. All right. Now I'll do a quick roll call for our speakers. All right. William uh, Litzow, are you here? Now well, let's hope he shows up. All right. Stacy, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Stacy uh, Bostjanik, are you here? All right. Gary Russell Hunter. This is an inauspicious start for our speakers. All right. Devin Casey. Good morning, Mark. Hey, Devin. Thank God you, you kept me from going 0 for 4. Uh, Donna McLeod. Good morning. Donna's here. Great. All right. Selena Hutchison. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. Great. Lovely. All right. Is anyone else uh, speaking during the NISPAC uh, that we have not heard from or, or I, I don't know about? So please, please speak now. Mark, this is Keith. Uh, Mr. Leetzow? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Keith. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed as we continue on here. All right, we're expecting this to be a fairly large audience. I think last time we had over 800. Uh, because of this, we will not be taking questions. Please email NISPAC, N-I-S-P-P-A-C, at NARA.gov with your question or questions, and someone will, will get uh, with you offline, somebody from my staff. Only ISU and NISPAC members will be authorized to ask questions through the meeting. We request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency if applicable before speaking each time for the record. As I said before, this meeting is recorded, so it's important that we're able to match the speakers up with the uh, questions or comments. Um, again, as I always do, I want to remind government membership uh, of the requirement to annually file a financial disclosure report with uh, the National Archives and Records Administration's Office of General Counsel, same form for financial disclosure used throughout the federal government. OGE Form 450 satisfies reporting requirements. You're not being asked to do this twice. We have several changes to the NISPAC membership I want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, we'd like to welcome Matt uh, Roche as the new alternate representative from the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. He's replacing uh, Carl Hellman. We'd also like to welcome Felicia Guess, along with her alternates, Michelle Caron and John Kiesling from the Central Intelligence Agency. Mike Scott, the primary with the Department of Homeland Security, has left us. He has been replaced by Robert McRae. Randy Akers, the alternate with the Navy, will be leaving us in about a week. Replacement for him has not yet been named. We are also welcoming our two new industry representatives to the NISPAC, whose term started October 1, 2020, Gary Jones and Tracy Durkin, replacing Bob Harney and Brian Mackey. For those departed members, thank you all for your contribution over the years. We look forward uh, to continuing the work you've done with the new representatives who I've just uh, named. As a reminder, the agenda slides and biographies for speakers are located on the NISPAC reports on committee activities webpage. All right, Greg, I'm going to turn this over to you. You're going to address uh, the status of action items from the July 15, uh, 2020 meeting. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. This is Greg Pannoni. Good morning, everyone. Um, first, uh, the NISPAC minutes from the last meeting. Um, those were finalized uh, on October the 10th, and they're posted on the ISU website. And then we had uh, four action items. So the first was for industry to provide instances of delayed processing of national interest determinations, otherwise known as NIDs, 
by cognizant security agencies and offices, also known as CSAs and CSOs. Um, this is considered closed due to the elimination of the NID requirement for a substantial majority of otherwise affected NISP contractors. And this was fomented by Section 842 of the National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2019 that um, removed this requirement for entities that uh, were under the national uh, technology industrial base uh, if their foci emanated, foreign ownership control or influence emanated countries uh, that are part of the uh, national technology industrial base. Could you please mute, mute your phone, whenever that is. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so anyway, that was action item number number one. Uh, action item number two was that ISU would convene a NISPAC NID working group with industry representatives. Um, a government-only meeting occurred on September the 16th. The next working group is scheduled for December 9th, and it will include industry representation. We've also uh, decided to rename the group the, the Foreign Ownership Control or Influence Group or FOCI Working Group to be more uh, representative of the issues that we're discussing. It's not just about NIDs. Um, action item number three concern DCSA's industrial security letter, also known as an ISL, on insider threat. Uh, the ISL is in the process of internal formal coordination at DCSA with their Office of General Counsel. Once promulgated, this ISL will replace ISL 2016-02, and DCSA will engage with cleared industry through the NISPAC to update tools, resources, and required training. And then action item four was to schedule another insider threat working group meeting. This action is considered closed as the meeting was held on September the 2nd. Um, do any NISPAC members have any questions about the status of action items? Okay, well, hearing none, uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. I thank you, Greg, for that uh, summary. Uh, at this time, I'm pleased to introduce, uh, we're going to go to our speakers and, and to each give an update. First on the uh, block is uh, Jeffrey Spinninger, the Director for Critical Technology Protection for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, who will give us an update on behalf of DOD as a NISP executive agent. Jeffrey? Uh, uh, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone out there. Um, uh, happy to be joining you today. Uh, honestly, wish I was, uh, you know, I'm not sure when it happened in my life that I've ever wished to make the trek up to Washington, D.C., but. Uh, but I wish I was there right now, uh, for sure. Um, you know, the, the importance of this, uh, this forum uh, and, uh, and, frankly, the opportunity for the candid discussions that happened before and during the breaks and after, uh, um, I, I miss uh, tremendously. Basically, it's an opportunity for people to help me be better at my job, and I, I uh, look forward to getting that kind of guidance uh, again here in the future, um, God willing. So uh, with that, um, you know, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, uh, you know, um, we've adapted pretty well in the department, I think, across uh, the federal government to, uh, to this uh, operating environment that we find ourselves in. And uh, since we were all last together, uh, there's been quite a bit that's, uh, that's happened that I think is, uh, is, is notable. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm just going to read a short excerpt from a Department of Defense policy document. Uh, so, um, if you if you uh, if you're students of this, I know pretty much everyone on this call uh, largely is that uh, that our, our acquisition partners, uh, you know, uh, under the under the direction of uh, of, of Ms. Lord, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisitions and uh, Sustainment, uh, undertook a, just a Herculean effort to to uh, to to address the way acquisitions uh, happens in the Department of Defense. Uh, and to, to be more uh, agile in, uh, in those endeavors. And, and uh, out of that was born something called the Adaptive uh, Acquisition Framework. Um, uh, and if you haven't, if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend that you become familiar with it because it's frankly the anchor point on which much of, uh, you know, certainly what we think about here within the Industrial Security Program. Uh, the, the capstone document uh, within, uh, you know, uh, all the myriad policy that, uh, that relates to acquisitions, and, and by myriad I mean myriad, um, uh, is the is the you know guiding directive uh, uh, 
what we refer to as the 5000, uh, 5000 .01. And so very brief ex uh, excerpt from there, uh, within the 5000.01 uh, is, uh, is under the subheading of Develop and Deliver Secure Capabilities. Uh, security, cybersecurity, and protection of critical technologies at all phases of acquisition are the foundation of uncompromised delivery and sustainment of warfighting capability. Now, that's not new. Some of that lexicon, some of the, 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 the verbiage there is not new to this audience. Uh, you know, the, this idea of uncompromised delivery uh, has been something that's been, uh, that, that grew out of what was VSS uh, in my former boss, uh, Mr. Stevens, uh, is, uh, we give him credit. I'm, decide whether he's Ben Franklin or Thomas Jefferson in that scenario, maybe both. Um, but the concept has grown into a thing. And the importance of, uh, of, of the partnership that we see emerging here with our, you know, this kind of renewed partnership, uh, I should say, that we see with our, uh, our acquisition partners here, putting that in a directive, uh, making that official Department of Defense policy really reinforces maybe what most in the, uh, on the call today know, and that is that, uh, you know, that uh, that the protection of uh, you know uh, you know critical technologies, the development of those technologies, the delivery and sustainment of those technologies, is a team sport. Uh, and for everyone here, again, kind of obvious, but but uh, but but I I still think bears repeating. The center of how that all happens and begins is uh, is the industrial security program. And so um, it's interesting, uh, you know, for for all of the the focus on. Uh, you know, kind of the, the, the challenges that we see here and this idea of uh, the rise of great power competition, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, that we, we need that reminder. But I think it's very, very important, and I thought it was uh, definitely worth uh, calling out. Uh, the policy was issued in September of this year. Um, if uh, any of you who are former government officials know what it's like to issue par policy within any agency, uh, it's a super fun time. Um, a bit like going to the dentist uh, without the benefit of Novocaine. So um, all that to say that the importance of the NIST has never been greater because when we get to this idea uh, the, 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 that, uh, that security, cybersecurity, and protection uh, are the foundation of that, right? So, well, the, the most important component of that foundation, of course, is the industrial security program. And, and I think that uh, that's uh, going to be, uh, I think, further exemplified. It's been some time since we've had a senior acquisition official uh, from the department uh, brief on this pack. I was, I was thinking back, Mark, and I think, I think, I, I don't know, maybe I'll be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure Brett Lambert, I remember him coming uh, once or twice back a long, long time ago. Um, but um, but uh, I think uh, just as a forecast of things to come in the rest, rest of the briefing. So if the industrial security program is as important as we all think it is, then, then that brings us kind of center stage to the NISPOM. And so uh, for, for those of you who uh, I'm sure all of you know that we've been uh, working the, the rewrite and uh, reissuance of the NISPOM uh, for, for quite some time. And uh, we, are in the, we are in sight of our goal. Uh, that's really the bottom line up front uh, to get to what's called an interim federal rule. And so uh, if, if the I, I described earlier the joys of issuing policy within a defense agency, um, that is now second to the real joy, which is issuing federal policy for the federal government. Um, and so I, I hear a little bit of chuckling. I think that might be you, Mark. And um, so we're doing this the first time. I, um, I, 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 I I got I got nothing. It is uh, it is a challenging challenging uh, endeavor. Uh, I think that would be the way to describe it. Um, we went into the 60 day comment period back in the in the latter part of September, and we've been back and forth, uh, you know, kind of receiving comments from uh, from many, many folks uh, and agencies that are represented here today. Uh, and we are at, a, the, at presently the the uh, the NISPOM is back with um, the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we are. Uh, it would be it would be foolish of me to to forecast uh, that success is imminent. Um, but all I can say is that all of the things that need to happen to get to success are continuing to happen. And so I, I will I will say that we remain uh, cautiously optimistic. However, uh, timelines would be if an interim federal rule is ultimately um, granted, that will happen sometime we believe before the end of the calendar year. If an interim federal rule does not happen, uh, then at some point rulemaking will kind of 
go into abeyance and uh, sometime in the springtime of the uh, of 21, uh, the process will reset some uh, and we'll move forward again from there. And so, uh, you know, we've got rabbit's feet and, you know, all kinds of, you know, trinkets and good luck charms out there to try to think that we're still on the glide path to get uh, to get the interim out uh, and we'll uh, we'll see where that leads us. Um, so that's um, that's uh, that's that. A um, couple other things I wanted to push out. So again, since we uh, once we were last together, right, so the department launched a very public uh, what we call an OPSEC campaign. Uh, you know, this, the uh, you know this, the secretary, uh, you know, just the leaks and, and just all kinds of things that just uh, you know uh, that had occurred uh, that that uh, that had frankly frustrated the the, the secretary and and think of many of his predecessors, uh, you know, and, and he had sort of a watershed moment and said, okay, enough is enough. We need to kind of get back to basics. And that's exactly what this campaign in its essence was. It was a reminder of things that, again, most of, you know, folks who are security professionals, which is probably the, the vast majority of folks on this call, uh, there, there wasn't anything, any cosmic revelations there except one, and that was that, you know, at the highest level of the Department of Defense, there was a call to action to, uh, you know, to kind of tighten our seals and, and get it together. And so, uh, again, uh, just in, in keeping with, um, you know, what, what, as I mentioned before on the, on the acquisition side uh, from the 5,000, you know, uh, the department, um, you know, in its, in its issuances, if you hadn't seen it, uh, or, and I, I hope that you did, right, but the, um, uh, you know, the department put out a very short notice that the DOD remains committed to transparency uh, to promote accountability and public trust. However, it is important to emphasize that unclassified information is not publicly releasable until it's approved uh, for release by any appropriate authorizing official. And as an exemplar of that, uh, those of you who can have uh, visibility on our slide uh, can see that we, we went through and uh, we have the clear for uh, open publications. Uh, you know, these are, these are processes that exist that, you know, uh, I'm sure there are variations on these processes across all agencies, but not hard to do. Um, but speaking with a uniform, uh, you know, and so that we're, we're level set, we're accurate, and what it is that we're intending to put forward uh, and, and put out there, uh, and we do so through, uh, you know, the official processes is something that we really wanted to be able to say uh, as, uh, as being very, very important. So, um, and, and mostly, uh, you know, with uh, kind of an eye for this, uh, the, the eye, uh, concept of accountability here, right? And that accountability, um, I, I realize the vast majority of folks on this call are, are not government uh, officials, but it was a reminder to government officials that accountability begins with the person that you're looking at in the mirror. Uh, you know, so it begins within the government and then makes its way out. Uh, you know, and that that is you know basic hygiene things. Uh, you know, marking. You know, obtaining. You know, release. All those uh, those those internal hygiene components that uh, that the secretary ex uh, expects to see. And so, with a nod to the folks on the CUI end of this. Uh, um, agenda later in the day, uh, you'll be pleased to know that, uh, you know, that the Executive Secretary of the Department of Defense will not process a package for signature by the Secretary or the uh, Deputy Secretary uh, that is not properly marked in accordance with the DOD issuance on uh, controlled and classified information. So um, uh, that's pretty good from March till now. Uh, that, that, that little that uh, took place in about the beginning of October of this year, and that's been uh, that's been really great um, for everybody not named Michael Russo, who uh, runs the CUI program yeah. for us. And so there's a lot of learning by doing going on. And finally, uh, then I, I really wanted to kind of talk a little bit about where our priorities lie for this year. Uh, I know 842 will probably come up again. Uh, Greg mentioned it this morning. Uh, 842 nests with 847. We couldn't say enough about how much we appreciate, you know, um, you know, the importance of the NISPAC to get us to where we are today. Uh, you know, the, the, the patience uh, of industry, uh, the persistence of industry, the, the facts and data that came from industry, and, uh, and frankly, the open-mindedness of our partners, uh, particularly in DOE and DNI, uh, to, uh, to get us to where we are today with 842, I think is really, is really quite good. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, it's incumbent on us to, um, you know, to, to, you know, kind of, Examine, you know, what it took to get where we are, uh, and then we'll use that as a springboard as we start to think about, uh, you know, and, and move forward on uh, on 847 and the broader concept of foci. 
uh, which uh, again I think you'll hear about uh, you know among later speakers in which we we you know um, cannot underscore uh, the importance of the working group process and the um, you know the the transparency that uh, the NISPAC affords us to get to where we need to be on this. And uh, and frankly, that's a nod to the last bullet on my slide there, where you have SCIFs and SAPFs. And so uh, so again, um, the the, the uh, SAP enterprise folks, uh, the DoD, the director of DoD SAPCO, uh, you know, are undertaking kind of a broad initial initiative uh, that uh, for which a number of uh, attendant security processes are a part. And so I, it's not for mine to speak on on on, uh, on those elements of the broader of the broader objectives of that. Those of you who uh, who do a lot of work with the DoD special programs are probably uh, becoming aware of that. But for us, uh, I put SCIFs and SAPFs out there. That has definitely been uh, something that has has risen up in the era of COVID. It's been out there for a long time. Um, uh, a couple jobs ago, uh, I remember this being an issue, and it continues to be one today. But with an eye for how we got to where we needed to be with respect to national interest determinations, uh, I wanted to put that out there. One, it's a priority for us uh, to kind of work across. And two, to say that you know, getting the right data, getting data in cooperation, collaboration with industry will help us uh, to make the right decisions, and, uh, and, and both with the, those for which we have control within the department and those for which, frankly, we're going to need assistance uh, you know, uh, and, and, and collaboration, cooperation with uh, you know, across uh, the other CSAs. And so we look forward to that uh, moving forward uh, you know, as the year progresses. Uh, and with that, uh, Mark, I'll stop right there, and uh, thank you very much for the time. Anybody have any questions for uh, Jeffrey? Any questions for Jeffrey? All right, thank you, Jeffrey. All right, I'm yes, sir, pleased to introduce. Yeah, sure. No, no, no that was uh, very comprehensive. I'm pleased to introduce now uh, William Litzow, Director of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Uh, after Bill is done, uh, you'll have some questions, I'm sure. Hi, Bill, please. Hey, thanks very much, Mark, and I appreciate the invitation to uh, uh, to talk. I think this is my first opportunity to uh, address the NISPAC, certainly as the director of DCSA. I can't remember what the conflict was during the July meeting, but um, I uh, am certainly uh, pleased to be able to be here today, uh, talk about uh, some of the things going on um, at DCSA. I think I've got a couple slides, so if you have access to them, if you just turn to the one that's at least in my deck, I got my name on one. That's probably not worth uh, pausing on. But if you go to the next one, <coughs> it's just a graphic depiction of what's happened in the last year or so. I know I've had a chance to speak to a number of the MOU groups that are part of the NISPAC, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll, so there could be a little bit of repetition for some of you, um, but for the NISPAC in general, um, I think it's worth just pausing to reflect on the fact that DCSA has been undergoing a lot of change any way you look at it. We all have, everyone who's dealing with COVID right now, um, this will be a special year on anyone's calendar. It changes the way we do business in lots of different ways. Um, but it kind of got piled on top of pretty massive changes uh, I would say you could say changes to DCSA, but really it's, it's changes that created uh, DCSA. As this slide kind of depicts, in the two bottom corners left and right, you have the two October 1 transfers, one a year ago and one just a couple weeks ago. A year ago was the big um, numbers of people, dollars, you know, where what was, uh, if you were to, Technically, look at it as a lawyer uh, might. It really, what happened is Defense Security Service acquired other components and changed its name into DCSA. And in that regard, it you know went from an 800 man, 800 million dollar organization into a, a 12,000 man, you know, two and a half billion dollar organization. Um, 
<laughs> and, and then there's other metrics that you can see there, 167 field offices around the uh, country and things like that that were added to the um, added to it a year ago. And there's been a lot of transition, as you can imagine, whenever you do that. More mission sets were added uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, the ENBIS program came over from DISA. Uh, DIS came over from uh, DMDC. You see uh, the, the polygraph school from DIA. You just talked about it. Uh, well, Jeff just mentioned the SCIF accreditation. Well, actually, I don't know if he did mention SCIF accreditation, but he did mention SCIFs. And in fact, just days ago, the Under Secretary of Defense for um, Intelligence and Security, uh, Joe Kernan, just before he left, signed out a memo uh, shifting that mission over to us. Um, and, uh, and several other IT systems. Some people don't realize, for instance, that yes, we took NBIB from OPM a year ago, but a few weeks ago, uh, a legacy IT system that goes back to, you know, 1984 when it was first put in place. And yes, it is the one that was hacked into by the Chinese a few years back. That also came under DCSA's cognizance in the last few uh, weeks. So, if you just look at the transfers themselves, uh, all of those different organizations and offices that are kind of depicted graphically on that slide have come together to form what's really a new agency, uh, DCSA, really just kind of finishing up its first year of, of existence in, in only the first few weeks with all of these mission sets uh, together. So <clears throat> even if there wasn't COVID, we would be undergoing a lot of change. And what you, uh, if you go to the next slide, what the, at least on my deck it says slide three, you see a fairly common representation we use, just kind of a, a, a way of graphically depicting the transformation that DCSA is going through. We kind of have it separated into phases, a transfer phase where we're bringing in the different components, a transition phase, which is the same kind of integration that, uh, every company goes through when it has uh, mergers or, or acquisitions. Uh, government agencies do the same thing. And then um, a kind of a larger, more profound transformation um, uh, phase, which is designed to make DCSA be the implementer uh, that everyone on this call would want it to be. If we were gonna have the, the kind of uh, personnel vetting that you would want the United States government to have if you were going to have the kind of industrial security that we would want uh, the U.S. government to have. You know, basically that's bringing us uh, solidly into the 21st century with the appropriate uh, innovation um, and optimization of, uh, of the different components to what DCSA does so that we're putting it all together in a way that, uh, that best protects our security. And that's kind of, uh, so, so I guess my main point would be, we are in a, <clears throat> in a timeline where we have completed most of the transfers. There's a few more things that are happening a year from now. Um, we're in transition. If you, uh, I think if you go one more slide, I've, I've uh, asked, asked them to put out there my transitional organization chart. And then we're uh, in the thick of transformational efforts right now um, as a new organization. I guess before I get into how specifically we're transforming, I would like to just uh, pause for a minute to, to reflect on the last year. Uh, a little bit of bragging on behalf of, of my agency and the, and the people who uh, work at DCSA, because I would say that, um, you know, it's difficult to change. Everyone knows that. Uh, change management is one of the most uh, complex leadership uh, um, challenges that people have. Uh, in this case, we've got all this change happening while going through COVID. I think, you know, for those who were around, my change of directorship with Charlie Phelan took place here in the conference room at DCSA in Quantico, uh, where I am now, um, there was maybe three or four people in the room. 
and we didn't even shake hands. Uh, I think we touched elbows because uh, COVID had just started. So it was already difficult on the agency. It became more difficult. But during this period, um, the way I often describe it, uh, and probably some of you were on a call yesterday with our stakeholders where I, I did it that way, where we have a – it's like we're in charge of changing the engines in this airplane while it's flying. You know, we've got to keep our missions going. Our industrial security mission continues. Our personnel vetting mission continues. We've got to continue flying the plane, but we need to uh, change it from a turboprop into a, a jet while we're flying it and and make sure we don't lose altitude while it's happening. So that's what this team has been doing, and that's kind of what I mean by wanting to brag about the work they've done, because during this year of pretty substantial uh, transition that's been going on, um, our background investigation team has further reduced its, uh, back, uh, its, its inventory from what you all know at one point was a 725,000 case inventory and is now hovering around a steady state 200,000 cases. You know we were looking, I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with the amount of time it took to uh, complete an investigation to get a top secret clearance or a secret clearance. Nowhere near our ERP to timelines yet in the fourth quarter of FY20. Uh, during COVID, we actually, for the first time in I think about eight years, hit the T5 80-day uh, ERPTA goal for a top secret clearance. We're hovering around 55 days right now for a secret clearance. And our adjudication facility, the, the consolidated adjudication facility, which handles about 89% of all of, um, of the adjudications uh, in the U.S. government, has now, uh, they had a fairly significant backlog a year ago as well. They've reduced it to a steady state, and they've fallen well within all the ERPTA timelines of uh, under 20 days, in some cases hitting uh, 10, 11 days for a top secret clearance. So, so basically, while the transformation has been taking place, the guys who are actually doing the work out there at the pointy end of the spear have been uh, keeping the mission going in a way that I, I couldn't be prouder of them. That's just the background investigation one I mentioned. Uh, obviously, you're familiar. Um, we have, you know, <coughs> the kind of heart of the agency, our industrial security mission that reaches out into all the others, has also been making massive improvements during the same time frame uh, in our foci mitigation um, uh, 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 assessments are being done in about a 40% shorter time frame than they were. Same is true with our facility security clearances. Of course, we've had challenges with COVID and everything, but at the same time, we kept up that processing and and are, are improving also the kind of the level of sophistication of the vulnerabilities that we're looking at. Um, Part of that, as I think a lot of you know, as we've, uh, you've heard in the past, things like DSS and transition and, and Rizzo and things like that that have not always, uh, uh, from my understanding, been received with uh, enthusiasm for, for good reason. But, but they've also, our attempts at change for good reason, too, because we're, we're moving from a vulnerability system that was kind of checklist-based um, where we're simply looking at vulnerabilities. You know, we call ourselves the gatekeepers. We're essentially looking at whether the walls and the gate are in, on a firm footing. And we've moved into a 21st century where we've got a much more sophisticated threat. And, and we cannot just simply uh, look at a checklist vulnerability um, kind of assessment. We've got to look more specifically at the threats because they're already inside the walls, if you will. They're behind the gate already. And in that regard, we have a counterintelligence capability that has been blossoming in recent years. Uh, you know, I could give similar performance metrics for them if, if we wanted to. You know, they're about 3.5% of DOD's uh, counterintelligence assets, but we're producing about 40% of the IIRs, you know, associated with emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, they'll probably produce about 6,000 IIRs today about 20,000 raw industry reports. That's something that wasn't even really happening a decade ago. Um, 
And then our training mission, uh, CDSE, we also have a national uh, training center, that, and of course the polygraph school we just adopted. Similar, uh, similar situation there. During transition, during, um, during COVID, they didn't really ratchet back the work they were doing. In fact, we've probably this year tripled the number of course completions. As you can imagine, during COVID, one of the things you can do is take online courses. So there was a much bigger demand signal put out to our CDSE team, and they responded by stretching all of our IT systems to the, to the limit um, as they move forward. Um, I, so anyway, a, a lot of great work been, has been done by the agency. You know, my goal will to keep all of those trajectories for our mission areas while also transforming uh, the agency into what you want it to be. And there I have a, a new office called the Chief Strategy Officer, or Chief Strategy Office. <clears throat> it absorbed what was previously, some of you heard of a personnel vetting transformation office. I was uh, involved in that before I uh, came in as the director here. And that office has, uh, we have a number of objectives uh, that we're using to move forward and, uh, you know, basically having a, a greater customer focus, coming up with an operating model that's more efficient, that makes sense, uh, continuing uh, uh, kind of better optimizing our, our leveraging of technology and innovation, and then kind of optimizing the organizational efficiencies we ought to be able to get by, by coming together. That, that team is working through the transformation initiatives that are, are, are going to take us to um, where we need to be. And there's a, another component to it I should just pause for a second because I know it is an area of concern across uh, the organizations represented in this meeting. And that is some of the IT architectures. Uh, you're familiar with the legacy IT probably doesn't uh, give a lot of heartburn to most of the people on this call. That's because you don't know what I know about the vulnerabilities of that <laughs> IT architecture. And uh, it's, it's probably the one that gives me the greatest heartburn. Uh, you know, OPM was the plan originally a year ago was that OPM would continue to run the uh, legacy IT architecture um, PIPs, it's sometimes called. That's just a, one of 80-some components to it. But, you know, that's, your taxes are paying about $150 million a year to keep that thing up and running. And OPM recently uh, told us they weren't going to, they just weren't uh, staffed to be able to keep it running in spite of the original agreement. So DOD had to adopt it on October 1st. Uh, now, ideally, we wouldn't need it anymore because I think what you're all familiar with is NBIS. We probably need a new name for that. Uh, National Background Investigation System was supposed to be up and running to replace the legacy IT system. Uh, it's not. Uh, it, it won't be able to replace that legacy IT system in the immediate future. So right now we've got to keep both of them running. We also just adopted the whole NBIS program management office on October 1st of this year. Um, some of you have heard about that uh, program. Um, I think in some ways some of the advertised uh, capabilities that it was going to provide were based on, the, on kind of technological development as opposed to a uh, operationally relevant capability. And in that regard, some of the promises, some of the expectations were were more sanguine than they should have been. Uh, one of the first things we did, and it was taking place as I was taking over as director, was a rebaselining of the NBIS program, trying to get some realistic expectations on the street and a, a more thorough, coordinated, uh, uh, integrated master schedule that would that would be capabilities based, so that we could actually start sunsetting the legacy IT structures while we were uh, building NBIS, and then also building it in such a way that we could um, factor in the new Trusted Workforce 2.0 requirements of continuous vetting that included some high side capabilities that weren't uh, originally factored into NBIS. So that's, that's kind of one of the big moving parts. And then the one that I think has a lot of people understandably concerned, it was brought to my attention 
I think, I think Mark, you might have signed that letter from ISOO. I'm not even sure, but uh, I certainly got uh, a wake-up call soon after coming in as director when there was concern expressed from our industry partners that the DIS uh, capabilities weren't quite up to where they should be before we're ready to sunset JPAS. And so um, we took a hard look at that, and in fact, uh, I I came to the conclusion that the uh, that the concerns were well placed, and we've uh, recently just adopted the DIS program from DMDC, another DoD component, a few weeks ago, and we have done a pretty hard look at that and come up with a a gap analysis and a kind of a a a set of criteria that we're going to use before we sunset JPAS. Right now, I think technically uh, it is still scheduled to sunset on uh, December 31st of this year. I'm uh, pretty certain that it will not be sunsetting there, and we're going to probably be extending that. In fact, I have a meeting with the new Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security tomorrow, and probably will raise that issue as a, something where he's going to have to change that target date. Uh, so that the chalk line that we were snapping at one point was a date-based, kind of a calendar chalk line. It was originally going to be October 1st, I think, and then it moved to December. It'll now be a, a, a capabilities-based uh, chalk line. But we are going to have to move forward fairly soon as we try to get our IT architecture up and running to support the, the new DCS missions. No, I'm getting to the end of the time. So let me uh, ask you to just turn to that last slide, the fourth slide. This was uh, just recently done. What this is is the transitional organizational chart. You had org charts for many of the different components. NBIB had its own org chart within OPM. DSS had an org chart. The CAF had an org chart. We have various offices that have joined. What, uh, like every uh, major organization, we will undoubtedly be reorganizing again in the, in the future. This, What I have here, though, is kind of a transitional org chart. On day one a, a year ago, uh, Charlie Phelan and I agreed that the thing that made the most sense was to um, put together an organization that caused the least disruption and change to the ongoing missions at that time. At some point, we'll have a transformational organization that kind of integrates the missions better. This is what I'm calling the transitional organization chart. The bottom row is what's most significant. These are our mission areas. Um, obviously, the pointy end of the spear is, is our regions and field offices. They don't dwell on those very much here. They've, they've stayed the same. We have not merged them yet. We have slightly different regions and, and office locations in the personnel vetting space that we have in the industrial security space and in the counterintelligence space. I broke out counter until so then you move one line up and you see the, the what I'm calling the seven kind of major mission areas of uh, DCSA. These would be the assistant director level leads. And I broke out counterintelligence from uh, what was then seen as a larger critical technology protection. Next one over, it says it's called critical technology protection. That's really where your industrial security sits. And I will admit that um, I almost changed its name to industrial security when we came up with this transitional org chart, but I got enough internal pushback that I thought, all right, we'll let it, we'll let it ride for a while. Uh, but uh, that is where a broader, what I conceive of as a broader industrial security set of missions resides primarily. Um, background investigations you're familiar with, but uh, for a brief period it was it was a, a much, even a bigger organization called Personnel Vetting, but we've broken it out to be product offerings. Background investigations is probably uh, manpower-wise the, the largest part of DCSA. Adjudications is about 600 people adjudicating mostly for DOD. And most of the people on this call should be familiar with the VROC, which is also why we left that name in place. Uh, but the VROC is, is kind of mixing the industrial security component of personnel vetting but it's also where we're doing the most change right now with respect to continuous evaluation, continuous vetting, and putting products, new products on the street that can be used by the 120-odd agencies that we support 
as well as industry as we're looking at um, moving into a continuous vetting framework. DITMAC, you're familiar with and looking at a clock. Training, I've already spoken of a little bit. These are our major mission areas. <clears throat> as you look up, these are the, the support elements are, are up above. I will say the program executive office, which is what houses end this right now, that's a little bit more than a support element in that if you really look at the mandate for ENVIS, it provides a architecture that can be used by other um, uh, investigative uh, branches within the U.S. government, not just by DCSA and the, and the agencies that we support. So it's got a little bit of an outward-facing component, too. That's the big picture of where we sit today. We're in the process of, of continuing to transform this organization, but to try to keep the missions going as we are. Um, and I, I'll pause there, Mark, because I, I do want to leave room for any questions uh, that someone might have. Sure. Thank you. No, please. Anyone have any questions for Bill? I can't, can't imagine that they don't. Bill, you did such a superb oh. job. You, uh, I guess, answered all the questions. Mark, I Greg, you good? Yeah, yeah. I figured you question. would. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is more of a just uh, for future planning. Looking at the, uh, DC, and by the way, fantastic. Uh, kudos to all of you, uh, Bill, and everyone at DCSA yeah. for what you're doing. Um, Absolutely. The, the transitional organizational mm -hmm. chart um, can't help but notice. You know, the rest of the world is overlaid there or underlaid, um, and forgive me if it's already in existence, there was a time when DSS, DIS had a presence uh, in, in European and Asian theaters. And, you know, today, of course, global is more than ever, and many of the folks on this call are with uh, companies that have global presence. So the question is simply, is, is there a plan in the future for DCSA to establish a presence, um, you know, either Europe, uh, Middle East, uh, or, or virtually anywhere in the world? Hey, thanks, Greg. That's a great question. And, and that's actually one of the things we are looking at now. Um, the presence that I think you're describing from the past, if my, uh, <clears throat> the history that I've learned upon coming here is, is accurate, to some degree that's been pulled back and it's supported from headquarters here. We do still have, now what's interesting is as we merge the mission sets, I do have a, a background investigation presence that's overseas, um, still overseas sitting there, but even that has ratcheted back a little bit during the COVID uh, situation. So uh, I didn't talk too much about some of the changes that COVID brought about, but I, other than just bragging about the fact that we kept the mission going during COVID without a, too much of a, a hiccup, but you can imagine there were a number of hiccups. Uh, we did a lot of passing out of uh, laptops and and uh, and software that needed to replace some of the in-person things that were taking place. Uh, paper copies of things, if we, we made more rapid the shift from paper to, uh, if you were to visit Boyers, Pennsylvania, uh, a year ago, you could have seen acres of file cabinets that looked like it was coming out of an Indiana Jones movie where the Ark of the Covenant was there, and those file cabinets are now gone, and, and they're replaced with electronic um, uh, uh, records. That's a good thing. So all that's a good thing, but part of it is the, um, the work we were doing in interviewing uh, uh, targets and, and – um, uh, well, the people we interview, I've lost, I've lost the name for it. But those uh, people over in Europe, a lot more of it was done by video conference and teleconference. And we're looking at how we want to go forward. I think all of us have learned things during COVID. We've learned about teleworking and where the, the limits are to what you can and can't accomplish. Um, but certainly our presence in Europe has has reduced both on the industrial security side and on the personnel vetting side more recently. And we're going to look, as we look at the operating model going forward, we're going to look at what makes sense for the future. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, very good. All right, anyone else have any questions for uh, Bill before we come to our next speaker?
Uh, yes, I do. This is Dan McGarvey from this pack industry. And sure. uh, Bill, I just thank you. Um, this is without a doubt very impressive and, and obviously very challenging. I, I would say that you're not just rebuilding an airplane, you're almost like rebuilding a city. Um, one thought I had as you go through your transformation process, it, I noticed that it, it talked about an operation operating model implementation roadmap. It would be terrific if at some point in time you could share that at least with NISPAC industry as you move along so that we know where DCSA is going and also where we could help in terms of supporting your different initiatives that take place. Um, because you've got on your transition piece, transition for two and a half years, transformation three and a half years, and even though it doesn't give a specific date, it looks like somewhere along the lines of maybe 2025 or something like that. So understanding where you're going would, would really help us. But once again, it's been a terrific uh, presentation. Thank you. No, th thank you, uh, Daniel. I, I appreciate the comment, and I also appreciate the uh, request. I, uh, I want to pull back the 2025 to maybe 2024 and treat that first year as if it's already – uh, gone by, um, <clears throat> just because I keep – it's funny, as you as you said, it would be good to see the implementation roadmap. I'm sitting here in my office saying, yeah, I want to see that out of my CSO office this afternoon, too, because they wanted to delay the meeting yet again, and I said, no, we're going to do it today. So, so we, it's not – obviously, it's not ready for prime time yet. It's a work in progress. It'll be iterative. It has been. But that's a that's a great point. Um, we are getting close to having a a more kind of a, a reticulated plan in place that uh, that we could share, and I will keep that in mind. And we'll we'll find a way to, um, you know, on the kind of public facing charts like maybe this transitional work chart, we could also put a uh, an <laughs> kind of a high level implementation plan in place um, because that is the next step. Um, but it is it is a one that right now, if you were to say, hey, could I look at that plan? I've got several of them on my desk, and none of them are quite right yet. So, uh, but thank you. We will get there. Hi, this is Kim Boggs from State Department. I, I just want to thank you for, for saying that you had thought about calling the program Keeping It Industrial Security, because from someone who's been in it for many, many years, I was a little disheartened when I saw the boxes yesterday and didn't see the words industrial security because it's a program close to my heart. So I'm glad that you struggled with that. And um, and it's and I know it encompasses a lot more than just industrial security, but I'm, I'm, I was just kind of glad to hear you say that. So thank you. Thank you. You've just encouraged me too because depending how you in, uh, how you define industrial security, I I personally think it could uh, that, that's broad enough that it could capture everything we do in critical technology protection but there are people here who have different opinions on it I would I would be on your side on that okay because I'm an old person that doesn't like change so but thank you though. all right well well good I'm uh, <laughs> what we're obviously trying to do is because this is such a big you know the transformation as 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 was just described goes out a number of years this isn't one of those kind of changes where you can rip a Band-Aid off and just do it all at once. We've got to phase it. And so really it was a question of, all right, we're going to do so many changes on this kind of phase, but when we start implementing the op model, that's when we probably will uh, kind of nail down what our various organizational components are called. Thank you. Anyone else have for, uh, for Bill? All right, Bill, that was an excellent presentation, and it's good to know that you're there during these tumultuous uh, times. You're making some real real progress, and we couldn't be happier, uh, you know, the way that uh, that you're, you're running things. So keep it up. Okay. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Sure. No, no. My, my pleasure. Next speaker uh, will be Stacy uh, Boschanik, Director of Cybersecurity, Security Model Certification Policy. Stacy. Hi, good morning. How's everybody this morning? Um, I don't know, did we send you guys a slide? I don't think so. It doesn't look like it. So um, I'm here to talk about the cybersecurity maturity model. 
Um, I think everybody is fairly aware of why we're doing the cybersecurity maturity model certification. And so I was going to give you an update as to where we stand. So currently, we have moved into um, from proposed rulemaking into an interim rule, which will become effective 30 November. Um, we are in the public comment period. I think we've had like 36,000 views. I think right now we're up to about 35 or 40 comments. And um, so come November 30th, the interim rule will be in effect, which means we will be in a position to um, in include CMMC as a condition of award. Ah, here we go. Okay, so we do have slides. All right. so. If you look at the slide that we're on now, we're talking about the interim rule. So as of November 30th, we can include the CMMC in select uh, acquisition programs as a condition of award. Now, the one thing that we wanted to talk about was there are several different parts to the interim rule that we're working with. As you all are aware that we have been um, to, here to date been doing the DOD assessment, which is the DCMA uh, group of assessors that go out and work with companies to either provide them a basic or medium or a high assessment. The basic, basic assessment is in line with what the original 252-204-7012 clause said, which is you need to self-attest to the fact that you have a system security plan and a POEM to be in compliance with the 110 controls required by the NIST 800-171. The medium assessment is where you get on the phone and you talk through your system security plan and your POEM with the DCMA rep so they have confidence and com comfort with where you are with your plan. And then a high assessment is where they come out and do a virtual, they either come to your, your uh, facility and do an over the shoulder look. This is going to be too much feedback. You know what I mean? Like, if you um, so, they, they, they will do an over-the-shoulder view of what your system looks like and be in a position to validate that the um, system securities are, that are in place that you say they are. And they will give you a score with regard to that. So, one of the parts of this interim rule with regard to the DOD assessment requires that by November 30th, all DOD contractors submit their basic assessment in the SPURS database. There's been a lot of confusion with regard to that. A lot of people are associating that with the CMMC rule. So I've been fielding a lot of questions on the SPURS database. There's a requirement to go into that database, fill out the basic information of your um, system security plan and your POAM to get there, and then you have to self-score yourself, evaluate yourself, as to what score you think you would achieve on the NIST 800-171 and the current DOD assessment methodology and have that in the SPURS database before December 1st. And a lot of the primes are letting the subs know that they cannot have their options exercised on existing contracts unless that information is in the database. So if you get reached, uh, if you have anybody questioning, we're, we have, um, information sheets that are going to be on the DPC toolbox website that will give explicit instructions on how to do that. On the CMMC rule, we are going to have um, a rollout of about 10 to 15 acquisitions in the first year. We're currently working hand-in-hand -hand with the services and the service acquisition executives to identify three to four um, programs within each service and three or four out of the um, fourth estate to begin implementation of CMMC. Now, what will happen, can you go to the next slide? Let's see what I have on the next slide. Okay, so I'll talk to this in a second. What will happen is as we identify those programs, um, in fact, Ms. Lord's getting ready to um, issue a press release with the first three or four programs listed so people can prepare and get ready. An RFI will come out. We have model language that we've prepared and gone through in some of our um, uh, tabletop exercises and, and our pathfinders that we've done that will be sent out to the acquisition professionals for them to be able to put the proper language in their RFIs and RFQs for inclusion in those, those contracts. 
the contractor will be notified. They will be able to issue, uh, submit a proposal. The proposal will be validate, uh, evaluated. And if they are the apparent offer or they will have to have the, the requisite CMMC certification prior to contract award. Now, if you look at the second slide, this, this shows you the phasing of how the DOD assessments are going to be phased over to the CMMC assessment eventually. And you can see it's a very slow progression, okay? And that the number of contractors that we really anticipate at the CMMC level three is not that high. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Okay. So this is, this is the, what I've, I've already spoken to this. This is talking about the, the SPURS information that needs to go in that database and that every contractor needs to have that um, listed before December 1 to continue performance on their existing contracts and new contracts as well. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So, this is, this is more explanation of that. I think, you know, the scoring methodology is one thing that has got some people confused. So this information is very important for, for um, different companies to have to make sure that they, they meet the, the need for that. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so again, these are our pilot programs where we've asked each service to provide us three to four programs. It, they will be, um, Manage the CMMC level three, which is just basic CUI. In the first year rollout, we will not address the, the higher critical technologies until um, 2022, 23 timeframe. Um, but currently, we've got uh, provisional assessors being trained by the CMMC AB. I think we have about 75 to 100 assessors ready to, to, to start working. We're working on the um, C3 PAOs. Now, those provisional assessors have yet to go through um, their background investigations. We're going to have, for CMMC Level 1 for tier, uh, assessments, they will have to have a Tier 1 suitability determination. For anything above that, they will have to have a Tier 3 suitability determination. The, um, the process, and I'm, I'm hoping the gentleman from DCSA is still on the line, because what we've agreed upon is that the CMMC AB will have an FSO that will work directly with DCSA to process and manage those um, suitability determinations for those individuals um, performing the assessment. There, those assessors will work with C3 PAOs, which are the CMMC third-party assessment organizations. Those C3 PAOs will, will have to have their systems evaluated at uh, CMMC level three because it is our contention that the system security plan information, the assessment information that they will gather um, when they go out to, to these companies to do these assessments would be um, needed to be safeguarded at a CMMC level three and be considered to be controlled on classified information. Um, can you go to the next slide? Oh, I guess one thing I want to make, make sure I mention, the, that COTS products are excluded from um, CMMC. They do not require a CMMC certification. So the, the slide you see here is our rollout plan. We plan to have 15 acquisitions uh, in FY21, 75 and 22, 250 and 23, 479 in the last two years. And then after FY26, all contracts will require CMMC other than the COTS products that I mentioned previously. Okay. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. So you can see here on this slide what we talk about is the percentage of companies that we anticipate being level one through five. And, and it is our contention that about 60% of the DIB will only ever require CMMC level one, which is their receipt of the um, federal contract information. One of the things that we're working on um, with Mr. Spenninger's office is to come up with a guide for the acquisition community because the, probably the toughest nut to crack is that when you have CUI at the CMMC level three, four, and five, 
how when you disaggregate that data and you start mapping it through the supply chain, where does it lose the requirement to be CMMC level three? Where does it no longer, um, where is it no longer CUI? And I guess one of the best examples that I can uh, give to, to illuminate what I'm talking about is Ms. Arrington went out to um, Transcom and had to meet with a welder. And he was quite frustrated because he didn't realize why he needed to have cybersecurity. You know, he said, I'm just a plain welder. And so she, when she went to visit him, she said, well, how do you, how do you know what to weld? And he said, well, they send it to me. And she said he had his Apple Mac laptop up on the counter. And she, she could see the, his uh, Facebook Messenger blinking and his Amazon delivery popped up while she was standing there. And she said it was an AutoCAD program. And she said, can you zoom out on that so I can see what the whole thing is? She had the entire structural design of one of our tactical aircraft. And she said, well, don't you think our adversaries would want to get a hold of that or get in and change the tolerances or the specifications of your weld so now your quality goes down and you no longer can garner work and it erodes our industrial base? Or how about if he just wants to steal your cage code information so he can redirect your payment to his account and steal your money? And one of the, the, the poignant parts about that is why did that welder have the entire tactical design? If the prime had only taken the time to cut out each weld and send him the necessary information that he only needed to do his job, could he not have been in receipt of CUI and had been, you know, that that would not necessarily have been CUI, those welds and those spot welds. So that's one thing we've got to work with our program managers and our primes to identify at what point do those, um, does that CUI, when it's disaggregated from other things, no longer um, hold the trappings of CUI and can only be CMMC level one. Because you're not gonna, it, it doesn't make good business sense. We probably can ill afford to have every member of uh, a procurement that's CUI, um, CMMC level three, be CMMC level three. If I'm just, producing a bolt, then I only need to be CMMC level one, and we don't need to, to um, have that contractor go through the expense of being CMMC level three certified. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so um, this, this, again, is just a, a breakdown of the CMMC rollout and where we expect it to be. Can you go to the next slide? And this is a breakdown by entity side. I know we've gotten a lot of consternation from the small businesses as to what does this mean to me, and they feel like they have a lot of, um, of a heavy lift and expense to become CMMC certified. But if you look at this, I'm not sure that many of the small businesses will ever have to be anything higher than a CMMC level one, and the cost for that is actually fairly minimal. Um, we also have, uh, go to the next slide, I'm not sure if we have it in here. We have a lot of programs um, right now with uh, Project Spectrum and the NIST-MIT organization and the PTAC that will be trained on CMMC so they can provide assistance to these small businesses as well yeah, to help guide them through the process, figure out where they need to be and what, what CMMC level they, they feel they need to have. There's also language in the NDAA that talks about a grants program with funding to assist some of these small businesses. But as you all know, we haven't gotten that approved yet, so we're, we, we can't hold our breath on that one quite yet. Can you go to the next slide, please? That looks to be the last slide. Okay. Well, so barring that, I will um, I'll wait for any questions. I'm hoping, unlike the rest of the people, nobody has any, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I'll break the ice again. It's Craig Pannoni. Again, thank you very much, Stacy. Great briefing. Um, <clears throat> and I, I don't want to overplay this, but, you know, looking at that last slide that we see on the rollout by entity size, um, 
could you amplify a little bit on what the criteria is for what is a small uh, entity versus another than small? Oh. Or if, if that's too okay. much for right now. I guess because I'm a little confused in terms of, you know, whether you're small or not small, you still could be working on a very significant piece of technology. And I, I don't know, I find it very interesting that none of them, as you pointed out, uh, would ever go above a level three. No, well, no, so uh, I, I I think that uh, I mischaracterized that if, if that's the way you saw it. No. I'm sorry, very, very um, few would go above a level three. I, I see right. there are some so, in the out years. Right. Now. And we, well, so in our rollout plan in the first year, we are only going to concentrate on things that are level three, because we're we're our training and our information for the level four and five for CMSC with those highly critical technologies is not mature enough yet. So we're only going to roll out at level three for for um, FY21, and that was our decision. Right now, what? we have to look at is when you start talking about those things that rise to the level of a CMMC 4 and 5, and they're associated with the level of criticality of that technology, through our uh, research and information, where, what we've determined is not that many companies are actually going to be participating at that high level. Now, remember, that doesn't mean that they can't participate on the program but we don't anticipate that their participation would in, in, uh, require them to have a certification at that higher level that other, uh, mainly the crimes are doing the work at the, you know, the big crimes at that, on that really critical, highly uh, uh, technical area. Now, that's not to say that you won't have one or two, mm -hmm. right? And those, those types of things are going to be, um, levels four and five are going to be extremely expensive. And we're anticipating that it will, you, the cost up to level three will be incorporated in your, in the overhead and GNA rates and the indirect rates of the company. When you get to levels four and five, those would pr most probably be a direct charge to the program just because it is such an expensive expense for the company that they will probably have a very difficult time um, affording it. So the program will probably bear the brunt of the, the uplift from, they'll have to pay on their own to CMMC level three, but four and five will be a direct charge to the program. Okay, thanks, thanks for uh, amplifying on those points. I appreciate it. And that, that's where I was going to, thinking about the expense involved in level four and five for those small companies. Right. Now, the one thing I did find interesting was there was a group of, and I'm going to probably be a little politically incorrect, but I'm going to call them cyber geeks on LinkedIn, and they were um, lobbying for the CMMC team to move some of the requirements from CMMC level four down to CMMC level three, and we were all snickering because we never expected anybody to say, hey, you need to make level three harder. And I'm quite sure that once we get through the public comment phase, we're going to reassess the MMC level three, and it, it's quite possible that those additional 20 controls over and above, above the NIST um, 110 are going to get looked at pretty uh, closely. Okay. Again, thank you. Appreciate it. You're quite Hi. welcome. This is this is Kim Bogger from State Department. At the risk of in front of hundreds of people showing my ignorance, um, I'm just kind of confused by this whole thing, which is on me. But, okay, but this all talks about DFARS clause, which is DOD, and it keeps talking about DOD. So is this yes. a separate – I mean, I'm not DOD. I'm State Department, non-DOD agency. Yes, ma'am. So yes, ma how does this get implemented? And do the contractors that have State Department contractors, contracts don't fall under DFARS? Again, I'm probably showing right. ignorance on that. No, no, you're, you're fine. No, and it, it, it makes total sense that you would ask this question. So to begin with, this is going to be a purely Department of Defense requirement, and that's why it's being implemented in the DFARS up front. Now, what I will tell you, though, is we have a lot of interest across all of federal government 
And I, are you familiar with the Federal Acquisition Security Council? Have you heard of that? Yeah, I think I think that we're, they're, we've been involved with them with some other clauses. Sure. With regard to yeah. um, some yes. clauses. Yes, yes. State Department definitely has a play in the Federal Acquisition Security Council. And that is um, a council set up to help improve our cybersecurity and our acquisition and supply chain risk management across the entire federal government. CMMC, so CMMC came into play because we instituted the 252-204-7012 clause, which is DOD only, that said if you're going to handle controlled unclassified information, you have to meet the NIST 800171 110 controls in your network to be compliant to handle it, which says you have enough protections in your network to keep people from stealing this information that we hold uh, as important. So that was came into play at the end of December of 2017. There was an IG um, review and then a Navy cyber readiness review that went out and kind of said, hey, let's see how contractors are doing with their self-attestation and the implementation of this clause that they were supposed to do. And they basically found out, mm, sorry for you, look, no, they weren't doing it. They were self-attesting that they were and they weren't because they just didn't understand or, you know, they wanted the business and they, didn't, they figured it's self-attestation, nobody's ever going to come look. So we'll just say we are when we aren't. So as a result of that, a couple of key companies were held uh, to task under the False Claims Act because they attested that they were compliant when they knowingly knew they weren't. So I think it was Rocket Jet Aerodyne got hammered for that for about $14 million, and I think Cisco got in trouble for it, for um, knowingly have, having a, a vulnerability in one of its products that they never bothered to fix. So as a result of that, our De uh, Secretary of Defense said, hey, we need to figure out a plan to be able to get out and start checking that these companies are actually doing what they're saying they're doing. So the DCMA uh, assessment group, they call themselves the DIBCAC, they began going, and they began with all the major primes going and doing these assessments on the basic NIST 800-171. But we quickly realized that they didn't have the bandwidth or the infrastructure to do all 300,000 companies in the DIB. So we got together with um, Johns Hopkins APL and Carnegie Mellon SEI, and we formulated the CMMC model which is um, the five levels of CMMC from one to five, one being just federal contract information, which is a requirement in the FAR 52204-21 that everybody across the federal government is supposed to be in compliance with, up to CMMC level five, which is highly technical critical um, requirement, requirements for highly technical critical technology, and those requirements include things like a 24-hour SOC. So, you know, it, it spans the spectrum of what kind of CUI and how sensitive it is and needs to be protected. Now, for State Department, right now it's not as big of a deal for you to pay attention to, but what I will tell you is that there is a lot of chatter across the entire federal government. DHS is closely watching what we're doing. Uh, Treasury, we've been in touch with, and they're very interested in adopting CMMC. And then this Federal Acquisition Security Council is also watching because a lot of people are looking at CMMC as maybe the foundational uh, piece to help the, our nation's industry become secure against a lot of these cyber attacks. Because if you look across I think around the world it's like $600 billion a year in intellectual property is stolen, and within just the United States it's $175 billion of intellectual property is taken by our adversaries. And, um, you know, I know you're probably aware that, that the, you know, the F-35 has had um, horrible problems because we now have an airplane that looks just like it in China, right? down to the fact that they have the same um, problem with their, their canopy on their cockpit that we do, right? So they, they even co copied in the same flaws that we have. So CMMC is a stepping stone 
to buying down the risk and stopping our adversaries from running away with all our data. So you are correct at the onset, when we roll this out in the next several years, it's not gonna apply to State Department contractors. Now, if some of your contractors work for both DOD and the State Department, then they will be required to become CMMC certified. So that was a long-winded answer to your question. I hope I answered it correctly for you. Yeah, my technical mind's a little tired today, but yeah, I mean, yeah, that's helpful because I'm just, you know, because the term DOD sometimes, especially in the National Dust Security Program, you know, we're a, we're, we're a non-DOD agency, but we're part of the NIST and our contractors, but like if we have a contractor that only has State Department contracts, then that they wouldn't apply to them, but if they had State Department and DOD contracts, it would apply on their DOD contracts only then. Yes, ma'am. Now, I will. But, but there is a FAR clause that you gave that, that if it's the FAR, then if State Department ever did it, it would have to be in the State Department, which is the DOSAR, as opposed to mm -hmm. the DFAR. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry yeah. too much time, but. And, and there, there's a, go ahead. You're breaking no, up a little bit. What did you say? Oh, and there is a potential, and I think with the Federal Acquisition Security Council, that it will eventually become a FAR clause. I think everybody's kind of watching to see how we do, if we fall flat on our face or if we do a fairly good job of getting this implemented, then it will probably proliferate. And I will also tell you we've had a lot of international interest. We've got countries coming out of the woodwork that want to implement it in their country as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for that uh, ex oh. exhaustive uh, <laughs> presentation. I think it, it answered a, a lot of questions. So, again, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, uh, you're this time we're gonna any time. Oh, sure. No, no, no. At this time, we're going to take a very brief uh, five-minute break, and then we will resume uh, with our next speaker, which will be from the uh, ODNI. All right, um, be back. It is uh, 1029, so what's that, 1034? Okay, uh, and then, then we'll resume. Thank you.
I guess I'm, I'm unmuted now. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, welcome back after that uh, five-minute break. Quick uh, admin note is apparently some of our slides and, and biographies aren't uploaded yet, So, but they will be, I guess, on our website within uh, 90 days. And if you have any questions, please just reach out to us. All right. With that, I'm going to turn to our next speaker from the ODI. and Kyla, you ready? I'm here. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, great. Thanks, Mark. So uh, my name is Kyla Power. I'm filling in for Valerie Kerbin today. Um, I heard a couple of mentions uh, regarding the National Center for Credibility Assessment, so I'll go ahead and start with Seed 2. Um, just a quick update on uh, Security Executive Agent Directive 2, use of polygraph in support of personnel security determinations for initial or continued eligibility for access to classified information or eligibility to hold a sensitive position. Uh, seed, this seed uh, was previously issued in 2014 and uh, was recently revised um, in light of the transfer of the National Center for Credibility Assessment, NCCA, from the Defense Intelligence Agency to the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Um, so uh, we just updated the authority section um, to reflect this transfer. Um, and uh, seed two was distributed to departments and agencies via the Security Executive Agent Mailbox. Um, ISOO also distributed to NISPAC members. And in October, so just uh, recently, we published this seed to the NCSC uh, website, so you can find it there. Uh, just transitioning to Trusted Workforce 2.0, I know that was mentioned earlier as well. Um, the Executive Steering Group, um, continues to meet virtually monthly and is committed to um, continuing to overhaul the security clearance process. Um, and the executive agent staff, along with the PAC PMO staff, continue to meet uh, regularly to work on policy constructs for the next set of documents in the policy framework for Trusted Workforce 2.0. Um, kind of along those lines, uh, the federal personnel core vetting doctor, doctrine, excuse me, uh, went through interagency formal review with OMB. Um, and uh, PAC PMO, um, in conjunction with PAC PMO, we provided a review with NISPAC members to socialize this draft policy 
And uh, right now, we're waiting for final signature by both executive agents, and then once that's done, it'll be published to the Federal Register. Um, also, just kind of wanted to remind everyone that in February, um, ODNI and OPM jointly signed executive correspondence titled Transforming Federal Personnel Vetting Measures to Expedite Reform and Further Reduce the Federal Government's Background Investigation Inventory. Um, and this uh, EC introduced important Trusted Workforce 2.0 reform concepts and measures to drive early adoption, including compliance with, or I'm sorry, with periodic reinvestigation requirements through continuous vetting for individuals in national security positions enrolled in a CV program that meets interim minimum standards. Uh, fact sheets describing and summarizing this EC uh, were distributed to departments and agencies as well as the public. And uh, we also provided a congressional notification uh, sent to oversight committees along with the EC. We're also working on an additional executive correspondence regarding um, trusted workforce um, and the transitional stages of trusted workforce 1.25 and 1.5, as well as future, the future state of trusted workforce 2.0. This uh, EC will provide policy and implementation guidance for moving towards continuous vetting to include how agencies will do automated records checks and agency-specific uh, checks. All right, so transitioning a little bit from personnel security and trusted workforce 2.0, I just want to make a mention about a couple of things regarding national interest determinations. Um, as Greg mentioned earlier, Section 842 of the uh, at fiscal year 19, NDAA, um, just some additional requirements came into play as, as of October 1st. So in light of Section 842, ODNI will no longer process national interest determination concurrence requests for covered national technology and industrial base or NTIB entities operating under a special security agreement as a condition for access to SCI. Um, so that's happened, but I do want to kind of just reiterate that ODNI is still continuing to process NID re concurrence requests for those companies that are not affected by Section 842. Uh, so that's pretty much all of uh, our updates. Um, we're still not operating at full capacity due to COVID-19, um, but we promise to continue the dialogue and provide updates on the industry forums like this one, as well as host meetings. Uh, to share information with our partners as we move forward with things like Trusted Workforce 2.0. So with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Kyla? Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, good presentation. All right, next we have Heather right, Sims. Heather Sims. Yeah, the NISPAC Industry NISPAC Spokesperson. Industry spokesperson. We'll provide the industry updates. Heather? 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 There's some audio trouble here. Trouble yeah. Here. yeah. Mark, do you want me to go in the meantime? Yeah, Greg, I mean, yeah, Greg, I, I don't know what, 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 what. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to be brief to keep <laughs> us on track, and hopefully Heather will get back on. Okay, got it. Um, <laughs> so um, we're going to do the part with the NISPAC working groups um, and some of the discussions that took place there. Um, you've heard from the DOD and ODNI on some of the high-level points that we discussed at the clearance working group. I'm just going to say CWG from here on out. We had that meeting on October 28th, um, and we'll, we'll also get some metric data on clearances and information systems uh, in a few minutes here. Um, we also discussed uh, at the CWG um, an issue about the Small Business Administration uh, joint venture, um, joint business venture final rule. Um, this was a surprise to us at ISU NARA. I'm not really sure why NARA did not see that rule before it was uh, promulgated, but in any event, the rule appears to eliminate the requirement for an entity eligibility determination in 
that what we've always called a facility security clearance for a joint venture. If the entities to the joint venture already have entity eligibility determinations. However, this contravenes the requirement in the NISP rule, the 32 CFR Part 2004. Therefore, um, we're, we and ISOO will put out a notice. Um, that we expect to have a forthcoming notice that emphasizes the continuance of the entity eligibility requirement for all legal entities to include joint ventures that enter into classified contracts with an agency of the federal government. Uh, another item we discussed at the CWG was NISP entity cost collection methodology. Uh, this is a requirement for both the government agencies and NISP contractors specified in, in both the NISP and the uh, classified National Security Information Executive Orders and their companion directives. Uh, we are holding a government only meeting on December 2nd to further discuss the cost methodology. Um, totally transparent, we've had two prior meetings. Uh, the goal here is to have consensus within the government on this topic of cost expenditures. This, by the way, is part of a larger effort within ISOO uh, uh, in terms of data collection to to take advantage of technology and facilitate how we go about collecting various uh, metric data that reveals how the, uh, the CNSI, the classified programs, and the NIST program, and the CUI programs are doing uh, as we report those to the president <coughs> um, annually. So um, after we, the government, we want to we want to achieve consensus and on the, 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 the cost expenditures that industry spends to implement the requirements of the NIST. I see will then host a meeting of government and industry to garner industry's input on this matter. And then finally, the NISPAC will be provided a recommendation on the way forward for collecting these data cost elements for industry's NISP implementation. Um, turning to uh, <clears throat> metrics, we'll hear from DCSA on their security clearance and information systems metrics, along with NRC and DOE on their security clearance metrics. Um, Last, the, the NISA, the National Information Systems Authorization Working Group, had a discussion with the National Security Agency, with a National Security Agency representative, regarding uh, sanitizing solid state drives, known as SSTs. Uh, this issue was initially surfaced by the NISA Working Group industry members in a white paper uh, to ISU on the use of cryptographic erase as a potential acceptable remediation method for SSDs involved in classified spillages. The NISA Working Group plans to continue the discussions with the CSAs on this topic. So uh, we're, as I said, we're gonna hear now from DCSA for their NISA update, but first uh, we'll have, excuse me, NRC provide their clearance metrics followed by DOE and then DCSA. So I'll hold off on questions at this point. So NRC, are you, are you on the line? I am, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay, I, I will. I will not go through the entire slide deck. I'll just focus on that first um, overall 90% of reported clearance decisions slide, uh, so I don't take up too much time. Um, in general, in terms of initiation, we're doing quite well over the last fiscal year, um, and in, in adjudications, we've had a few slip ups. You can see that we've exceeded 20 days a, a couple of times over the fiscal year, primarily in quarter four. Um, I, I don't have a specific reason for that. I think it's a couple of things, you know, staff taking leave, um, cases just slipping through, through, the, through the cracks. Um, but overall, what we're meeting or exceeding our adjudication timeliness. And, um, I, you know, despite all of the, the hurdles we've, we've had to overcome over this past year of transitioning to basically 100% from home, um, I think we've done quite well. Um, uh, again, fiscal, I'm sorry, quarter four of the fiscal year, we've experienced some blips, but I think move, having moved into fiscal year 21, we'll get back on track where we're hitting or exceeding our adjudication timeliness. Um, that's essentially it for the NRC. Again, since we've done well over the last fiscal year, I, I don't have really much information to provide or reasons why we, we aren't meeting those, those goals. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move to DOE. We'll, we'll do the questions as we stay at the end. Hey, good morning, and thanks, Greg. Um, so if the slides are up, if we can just move to slide two, I'll go through the slides and give everyone an update. Um, so as far as our initial T3 and T5, our adjudication timing has went up by two days. 
but we're still exceeding the um, timeliness goals. As far as top secret adjudications, we are also we also increased those by two A's, and again, we're meeting the timeliness goals. As far as the secret um, investigations, we saw a two-day decrease in adjudication timeliness for the quarter, and uh, T5 reinvestigations. We had some substantial improvements in the adjudication, um, and we dropped from 40 to 14 days. And last, the initiation timeliness for T3Rs um, decreased by six days, and we're also meeting that timeliness goal. If we can go ahead and move to slide three. So over the last uh, year, we've exceeded the initiation goals and the adjudicated, adjudication goals, and we expect that those trends to continue. Uh, slide four. On average, we met our adjudication goals um, as it relates to the initial T3 at um, 15 days over the last year. But we had we did have some bumps in the road as it related to adjudication for the months of June and July. Uh, we've been on a downward and steady trajectory since August for initiation time in it and expect that downward trajectory to continue. Uh, slide five, um, as far as the T5 reinvestigations, we're meeting the initiation goals, but again, as you saw in the, the second in this slide, we did have some challenges over the last year for adjudications, but since May, we've been make, meeting both the initial adjudication timeliness goals, and we expect uh, that trend to continue as well. Uh, slide six, please. Uh, as far as the T3 reinvestigations, on average, uh, adjudication has decreased from 18 uh, to 13 days. And overall, we're right below the initiation time limit goes at 13.5 days. Uh, this concludes our briefing for DOE and then by to answer any questions. Okay, let's uh, thank, thank you, Tracy. Um, we'll do the questions like I say at the end. Let's move to the DCSA clearance metrics. I believe Donna McLeod, you, you're gonna be doing yeah, that. Good. Yes. Um, you, good morning, Donna McLeod from DCSA. And actually, I'm just going to touch on additional metrics that the director um, actually shared on his comments this morning. So I'm going to present information on behalf of the background investigations, adjudication, and the Vetting Risk Operations Center, VROC. So the background investigation, as the director shared, our timeliness and inventory remains stable for Q1. Our numbers for the T5 initials, again, the director shared this. Our timeliness numbers are 81 days for T5 initials. Um, if we would remove those cases that were impact, or impacted by COVID-19, that number would drop to 77. And cases impacted by COVID, what that is, and in our inventory, we have some work that we can't complete because the sources or the information we need to get to, we can't get to it because the places may be closed down or inability to contact subjects and sources. So what we have done is we have holding those cases into our inventory. So in doing that, when the case is closed, that's going to impact the timeliness of our cases. And that's primarily on our T5 population. Approximately 10% of our T5 cases completed in Q1 were delayed due to COVID. The T3 cases are not as, not impacted as much. Our T3 initial timeliness is at 55 days, and the goal is to be at 40. Again, we're still working through the inventory, but we are impacted by um, some delays due to COVID. Um, as the director shared earlier, our inventory right now is around 200,000. Um, of this number, 32, roughly 32,000 are industry investigations. Moving on to adjudication, uh, the inventory for adjudication, the DOD CAC continues to apply portfolio management techniques to deliver national security suitability and credentialing adjudication. The two portfolios are divided into the readiness portfolio and the, and the risk management portfolio. The readiness, readiness portfolio represents those adjudication actions designed to get people to work, where the risk management portfolio manages risk within the trusted workforce. Currently, the total industry inventory is uh, 27,000, 72%, which is within the readiness portfolio, and the remaining 28% is in the risk management portfolio. For adjudication timeliness, FY20Q4, 
the DOD CAF adjudicated tiered investigations for industry in an average of 14 days for initials and 34 days for the periodic reinvestigation. Um, the DOD CAF is operating a full mission capability and modif with modified operations to our customer service center due to COVID. We expect to continue to be fully mission capable throughout COVID-19 and to continue meeting adjudicated timeliness requirements for our investigations and products and services for the year. Um, on to VROC, um, VROC is staying laser focused with all the VROC industry functions to include investigation submission, interims, PR, CE deferments, processing incidents, reports, and customer service and balancing all of the timeliness to support the mission readiness and identifying and mitigating insider risk, insider threat concerns. Um, for the investigation submission and interim determination, the total industry for FY20 investigation request submission is 190,000. 90% 90 of all initials investigation had an interim determination made on an average within five to seven days. But we did have some system challenges in October which has since been resolved, but they did result in a longer than usual lead time for interim determination. So we're now averaging 25 days for interim, but we anticipate to be back, to, back at our steady state within a few weeks. We appreciate your patience during this time. On to our PR deferment. Um, for industry, PR is deferred to CE to date. Um, over 100,000 100, um, have been deferred. Um, VROC will send the FSO a JPAS message when subject investigation has been stopped in JPAS and the subject is enrolled in CE. FSO can share the fact that the PR has been deferred into CE with the subject. All industry deferred PRs are enrolled in a fully compliant CE program. Um, for CE, uh, about 2.3 million subjects are subject enrolled in CE data. 2.3 DOD subjects are enrolled in the continuous evaluation data sources via DOD system, meeting partial CE data category requirements. Approximately 455,000 of which are industry subjects, which represents approximately 21% of the population. All industry, de all industry deferred PRs all enrolled in all seven data categories and compliant with C6 to further support reciprocity. Um, you will see enrollment increase significantly in this FY as we work to achieve the goal of all clear population into a trusted workforce compliance. What we need from you is to be responsive if you have any overdue PRs or if we request an out of cycle SF86 to be submitted. Enrollment, enrollment requires a minimum of the uh, 2010 version of the SF86, which we do have most of them, but since the 2010 was not deployed until the 2012 timeframe, we may have to come back and ask for um, updated SF86, new SF86. Industry and, government, industry and government customers can confirm CE enrollment in their history and disk. Government customers can email VROC for CE enrollment verification. CE industry FAQs are posted on the DCSA website under IMFSO FAQ. The CE questions are numbers 35 through 46. And as a reminder, um, please rem um, remember to get provision in this. Um, JPAS will be decommissioned and it's imperative that everyone is provisioned. And that concludes my metrics update for DCSA. Okay, thank you very much, Donna. Again, we'll, we'll roll right through to the NISPAC, uh, NISA, National Information Systems Authorization Working Group, uh, and then we'll do the questions. So, Selena Hutchison, are you on the line, please? Yes, I am. Okay, please go ahead, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I wanna start by uh, congratulating a cleared industry for the hard work that we put in on EMAS. I want to share a fun fact of the NIST version of EMAS is the second largest instance in DOD. The largest instance is the Navy. It's been in effect for over eight years and they have over 7,000 users. Our one year anniversary for the NIST EMAS was in May of this year. 
we have the second largest instance due to the number of containers. We have 6,300 systems included, approximately 3,400 users, and 2,100 containers. And the container is uh, based on case code, uh, cage codes and systems that put there. This would not be possible without the hard work that's been uh, provided by Clear Industry over the last year to make this possible. So I want to thank you for that. And for clearly, most of you are not winging it, but for those of you who are, we ask that you uh, really pay attention to the EMAS rules and, and help us keep this system where it should be. So I just want to begin with that. Most of you know that Carl Helmet left the agency in September. I've been acting for Carl since that time. The Southern Region AO, Ron Donnelly, retired in March, and David Scott has been acting there. Tyquisha Somerville is acting in Capitol right now. We have approximately 82 ISSPs on board. We are averaging about uh, one, there is a one ISSP to 75 system. So what you'll find is that the ISSPs are also working AIs and ECPs and ESBAs and CM and outreach. Our average days to authorization is about 60, so we're still within that time frame. If you would go to slide two, please. The DAPA release in September covered two specific things, primarily type authorization. There were some inconsistencies in how it was being applied, so we want to clear that up. The federal IS that was also clarified in that version has been a, a major issue for us. We continue to see a misinterpretation of what a federal IS is. This is a uh, federal IS will lead to a government to government conversation and any exception to that policy will be granted by USDI. And keep in mind too that a federal IS exception to policy would be only a temporary measure to get you to compliance. So I wanted to stress that. Uh, slide three, EMAS, we just talked about briefly. Clearly, most of you are doing very good work here. We have a small staff, so in those instances where EMAS is not being used in the proper workflow, it creates problems for everyone. So some of the common issues we see is incorrect registration, improper routing to the wrong field office, system descriptions are improperly recorded, using the incorrect overlay, missing artifacts, all of these things just kind of add to a situation that we don't need. So a little bit more care and rigor would be very helpful here. We ask that you visit the EMAS site and use those documents that we put out there for your own internal training that will help the consistency across the regions and also help us do a better job doing our reviews. On slide four, nothing much has changed for us during COVID except for the delay in getting to on-site activity. And keep in mind that when we do go back to work full-time, we will have to adhere to state and local policies as well. We are working to continue to extend these systems, working to get the ISSPs to triage and give you guys an answer without waiting to the last day to turn these plans back. So all these things are being worked. You see some numbers here from each of the regions. And uh, in summary, I just want to say we want to continue to work with you, identifying gaps, correcting those gaps and in inconsistency in policy. We are going to be focused on improving quality as the year goes forward and having all the leaders in the region work toward these inconsistency issues that we're seeing. We're trying to reduce the impact of how work comes in the ISSP, which is why we consistently ask that you submit a complete system security plan because we're not resourced to review 10 controls and send it back to you and then have you send it back to us. Those type of uh, processes just kind of eat the clock up. So that's all I have. Hope I didn't rush through that too fast. Uh, thank you, Selena. Um, so are there any questions about any of the working groups or their updates? Uh, hearing none, um, I, I think we have a, another slight change. Uh, Heather has been emailing me, uh, Heather Harris from our ISOO, indicating that 
that Perry Russell Hunter would like to to go next. Uh, I, I defer to you, uh, Mark. It, it yeah, no, to... let's uh, yeah, let's let's, let's let's get Perry on. Yeah, okay. sure. And let's promise industry next time you, you will be the first on the on the agenda. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, I, I can I can return the favor by being very brief. Uh, so, uh, my my Doha update is that um, we we are finding ways to be productive in the age of COVID, and I, I have to give a uh, a very uh, public shout out and thanks to uh, the leadership and the um, uh, the personnel uh, at the DoD CAF because. Um, Thanks to Mariana's leadership um, at the CAF and the uh, professionalism of all the, the adjudicators there, uh, we've been able to stay current in the legal reviews of the statements of reasons in industry cases. And that turns out to be really important because when uh, the statement of reasons is issued, it is the notice to the individual, the contractor employer, uh, employee rather, who uh, of, of what the government's concerns are. And so we don't want that to be a mystery, and so we didn't want there to be any delays there. And uh, just to give you an example, in, in fiscal year 2019, uh, Doha conducted uh, over 2,500 uh, legal reviews of uh, statements of reasons um, from uh, for the DOD CAF. That was uh, uh, 2,571 to be exact. But in the current fiscal year, the fiscal year just ended, uh, fiscal year 2020, uh, Doha was able to conduct uh, 3,248 legal reviews, and uh, we and the CAF are completely current in terms of uh, issuing statements of reasons. And that's really important for uh, getting the word out for um, the employees as to what's going to happen next in, in administrative due process. Um, uh, now, the other thing that's going to happen um, next year, um, and we're, we're, we've been working uh, diligently toward this, obviously COVID has been uh, a, uh, a factor in this, is that um, at some point next year, Doha will start issuing uh, the industry statements of reasons directly uh, to industry contractor uh, employees. Now, those of you who remember uh, back before uh, 2012, remember that, that, that Doha used to do that in the past. Well, we will be returning to that mission um, with uh, uh, an agreed transition taking place between Doha and the DOD CAF, and we are working out the, the details and the implementation on that right now. Uh, but the, uh, the agreed implementation of the process uh, obviously was, was delayed by the, the pandemic. Um, the good news, though, is that the pandemic did not stop us from returning to holding in-person hearings, uh, which we did in June of this year, um, in addition to some rigorous uh, health and safety protocols, uh, which, quite frankly, we, we took from the uh, federal district courts uh, that were in the, the highest COVID uh, areas. Uh, so we, we require masks. Uh, we have gloves available. We have uh, plexiglass, and we also have a new amplification system in the hearing rooms. And of course, the reason for that is because uh, we've discovered that, that it is important to, to keep people masked even when they're speaking and testifying, but the amplification system helps them be heard and understood. So, uh, so that's, that's actually working very well, and we've successfully uh, continued to hold uh, in-person hearings. Um, we're also uh, developing uh, a, 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 and expanding on our existing uh, remote video capability. Uh, the idea is that uh, right now, we, we, many of you know that we've been using video teleconference technology for many years uh, to reach out to remote places where contractors are, are located. But now we, uh, we've just uh, uh, procured a brand new video teleconference system that will work more effectively with the JSP firewalls and be able to go more places. We're also working on the ability to conduct hearings remotely where people will be able to uh, be invited into a secure system um, from their remote computers. Uh, that has not yet been uh, unveiled, but um, we're working on, on deploying that um, in the very near future. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. 
Greg, do you want to go to uh, Devin next, just so we can finish this this part of it, and then go back to Heather? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, Heather, are you are you on the line though now? Are you able? I am. Yeah, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Why, why don't you do yeah. Heather Mark? I would suggest at this point. All right. All right, Heather. Let's 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 get you while we can. Go, please go. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I was on the line for some reason. I just I couldn't get unmuted. Um, uh, so good morning. Yep. Uh, it's a pleasure. To, uh, I'll go. I'll try to go as quickly as possible, but cover my material. Um, it's a pleasure to provide the uh, industry perspective today on a variety of uh, topics, many of which we already talked about. Um, but I'd like to go ahead, and I know it was already mentioned before, but to um, to thank the outgoing industry news type members, um, Robert Barb, Bob Harney, and um, Brian Mackey for their years of uh, support, and then also welcome Derek Jones and Tracy Durkin. And we do look forward uh, to the next couple of years uh, working with a dynamic team. Um, I want to say my perspective on industry has certainly changed over the past three years since moving from government to industry. I'm finding the balance knowing firsthand government's role in the NIST with now having a glimpse of the demands and limitations put on clear companies who truly want to do the right thing. The past year, um, the NISPAC industry members, along with the Memorandum of Understanding Industry Association members, have worked hard to bridge the gaps between government and industry. Industry has encountered an enormous amount of change, much of which um, was certainly needed, but nonetheless, the past few years, it's been pretty hectic on industry. Um, and industry is encouraged, though, however, by the increased level of partnership and collaboration by the government at large. Um, I do have five uh, current top five missed priority watch list items for industry um, on the slide that was provided, but they're in no particular order. And I've said it a few times already this year, but I also want to offer um, our thanks again to PAC PMO, ODNI, and OPM for the willingness to proactively understand impacts to industry on personal security reforms um, as it begins. Industry understands we have a long way to go until full implementation, but we're sure that our voices will be heard throughout the process. Next, uh, foreign ownership uh, control and influence was typically reserved as a concern to only limited amount of cleared companies or new companies waiting to be cleared that were usually under foreign ownership. Industry has already begun to see a shifting in the government's focus of foci to the control and influence, influence portion. Well, the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR Part 2004, clearly defines ownership part of foci. It really doesn't do justice in defining the influence and control. Industry would like ICU's assistance in having a better understanding and definition of control of influence um, for its foci and how it applies to the NISP. Without a clear and consistent objective of what we're trying to mitigate from all five CSAs, and with a better understanding for industry of what they may be subjecting themselves to, it leaves a lot to the imagination. Understanding the risk tolerance thresholds and basis for the risk will be one of the areas industry would like to focus and discuss at the next scheduled NISPAC FOCI working group meeting. Transparency to cleared industry and the government customers in advance of the anticipated process changes only improves the ability to properly mitigate risk on the front end. Moving on to uh, supply chain risk management, um, it's been a hot topic for many years, um, but we're seeing action to the implementation of the many statutory and regulatory requirements. Um, um, DOD already mentioned about the DOD adaptive acquisition framework, and industry realizes that many of the regulatory requirements are embedded in the acquisition process now and not necessarily the NISP, but it does have a direct impact on the NISP at large and the supply chain of the NISP uh, contractors. One specific example is NDAA Section 889, where clear companies are making self-attestation that they're not utilizing banned products and services. Where industry is struggling is a government-provided all-encompassing list of products and companies to ensure we're attesting to the same thing and being consistent with our understanding of what is banned. We do ask DOD to provide some guidance on what products and companies we should be looking for in our supply chain. There is concern that industry may be missing a product or service and thus will be putting our facility clearance and ability to bid on future contracts in jeopardy. There are other areas of focus on supply chain, but this is really at the forefront of industry's mind today. And uh, moving on, not only is our operating environment affected by COVID pandemic, we're also challenged by the changing security landscape. Thanks to the government partners for quickly adapting many of their processes and procedures during this on charted time. In particular, thanks to DCSA for listening, listening and adjusting to keep industry operations so viable. 
Um, additionally, thanks to the DCSA director for his transparency during the stakeholders meeting yesterday on how he is continuing to evolve from a service um, to an agency and absorbing new missions. Industry does understand that it takes time on um, transformational changes uh, in government. We do appreciate the updates. And I want to add that traditional security and cybersecurity are no doubt shifting, and the ability to maintain and pay those highly technical required workforce employees to meet the emerging regulatory requirements will no doubt have an impact in the foreseeable future. As baby boomers are retiring, they are being replaced by a much younger workforce who enjoy the agility of working remotely, have the expectation for higher salaries, and are not often wanted to work in a structured security environment. When we talk about implementing the correct security mitigation strategies to counter the threat, we also have to start having that conversation about properly funding contracts to account for the right workforce along with the best security posture to produce those products and services uncompromised for our customers. This also goes to the conversation of gaining the support that security is not necessarily just an overhead within industry. One notable area that industry has um, been uh, exerting an amount, enormous amount of resources in managing all the government systems developed and utilized to manage the NISP. Thanks to ISU and the NISPAC members for forming the NISPAC NISP uh, system working group, it was enlightening to see actually all the NISP systems that were out there being used by industry. While there have been increased partnerships on new systems being developed and tested, there is still one standout concern for industry and government customers alike. The transition from JPAS to DISC is still a topic that requires much more conversation and a plan of action that includes functionality corrections, data integrity fixes, and training to be understood by all customers and government alike. And I'm, I'm moving pretty quickly here, but I'm moving over to my focus areas. Industry over the last year has focused on efforts um, of mutual benefit in addressing our collective concerns for the benefit of the entire cleared industrial base through increased engagement. We're finding together we're stronger and have a bigger voice when we work together. I ask the NISPAC industry members um, are utilized to the greatest extent possible to address industry NISP concerns with the government to ensure the full complexity of the NISP are considered when devising new and approved processes. Also, the industry associations reach out to other associations and to industry NISPAC members when working on the NISP effort that affects cleared industry to ensure we're all on the same page. It is a consistent comment from government that I hear that often we have conflicting industry viewpoints. Being better aligned brings us closer to becoming trusted and respected NIST partners. While industry is making strides on collaboration with government, we are still finding many industry partners are fearful from speaking up during assessment and to self-identify vulnerabilities to government overseers as some tend to be punitive in nature instead of working to the common goal of mitigation. Many times we have very talented security staff within industry, many retired government senior leaders, um, senior level executives that have many years of threat mitigation experience, but are often overlooked due to being in industry. We must work together to respect each other's experiences and expertise. Industry is hopeful that in the future as oversight models are evolving, that we get to, get to the point where we can partner, provide full transparency of our security concerns, have a better understanding of the threat, and work toward a truly risk mitigation model to preserve national security. Industry is con uh, continuously tracking new legislation and policy changes that would have an overarching impact on our operations. It's vital that the C CSAs are transparent to the greatest extent possible, and at the local level, there's consideration for what the primary role of the contract is, which is to produce a product or service to the government, albeit uncompromised, but we have to find some balance. What really I'm trying to say is when a new policy is developed, often the additional requirements added, not only is the policy changing, but industry also account, encounters additional add-on non-contractual requirements, newly implemented training requirements, and so forth. After a while, these items add up and could potentially lead to contract delays on deliverables due to unforeseen requirements that were not anticipated in the original contract award. While industry sometimes understands the importance of additional requirements, we ask for a well thought out plan that takes in consideration the impacts to industry's operations. Um, with the additional requirements, industry is also experiencing overlapping interactions sometimes with oversight and possible fracturing of the NIST. And we ask that agencies try to deconflict and engage with each other before making contact with industry. 
Prior to COVID, some contractor sites were visited by, visited by multiple government agencies reviewing the same material processes. Now we're um, about to add CMMC and gearing up for COI oversight. And we look to NISPAC to work on potential resolution to avoid any duplication effort by both the government and industry at large. And uh, that was pretty quick. I cut some things out, but I, I also want to um, thank um, um, everybody for their time today. And we look forward to a new year. I'm looking forward to 2021 and strengthening our relationships with our, with our government partners. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Heather, for that presentation. Anybody have any questions for uh, Heather? All right, thank you, Heather. All right, Devin, we're going to turn to you to talk about, uh, give us a CUI update. Yeah, happy to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devin Casey for the CUI program. Um, just a quick update on you know, where we are standing with the CUI program. Currently, our office uh, is, is still receiving some of the CUI annual reports from agencies. Um, the primary deadline has passed. Uh, however, there are some extensions that have been granted. Uh, those should all be in by the end of the calendar year. Um, we use those to get a better understanding of where agencies are in their implementation of the CUI program um, and provide a, a general update uh, through the, the annual, our annual report to the president, uh, the ISU one, um, about the status of agency implementation for CUI for the government. Um, we did have two notices, uh, CUI notices come out in October, uh, CUI notice 2026 and 2027. Um, 06 covers the uh, marking practices to for waivers, um, when waivers are in place, to alert users to the presence of CUI. And uh, CUI Notice 2020-07 covers the use of alternate designation indicators, or ADIs, um, with CUI when they're authorized by policy. Um, one of the big things that, that's definitely been going on in the CUI world has, has been DOD's implementation of CUI. And we've got a lot of questions into our inbox um, and on some of our blogs as well uh, about specific questions about DOD's CUI implementation. So I'd like to point everyone to DOD's website, um, dodcui.mil, uh, where they have a, a contact us there. There's also a, a link uh, on the top of that website where you can look for the point of contact for the different components at DOD. Um, and their CUI point of contact there, as well as a bunch of information about DOD's CUI program. Um, it is generally we'll ha where I'll have to send you if you send us a question about DOD-specific implementation questions or concerns. Uh, final update, uh, CUI FAR case uh, is still a little bit delayed based off of the prediction on the unified agenda. Uh, we're, we're nearing the closing time of comments for that, and it, and it hasn't come out yet as predicted. Um, so it's still delayed. Uh, GSA will have a, a new estimated uh, time frame coming out shortly, um, and you can always find out an update uh, or anything new about the CUI program on our CUI blog. Um, we'll also be scheduling shortly a CUI stakeholder meeting uh, for December to go over updates to the CUI program as well, which is a great, great way to stay up to date on any developments in the CUI program. That's all I have. Sure. Uh, anybody have any questions for uh, Devin? Uh, hey, uh, this is Jeff Spandrew. I don't have a question, but to, just a comment to, uh, to to echo and flip stomp uh, something that Devin said, uh, and th th thank you for mentioning it. Um, but for those of you who have questions pertaining to DOD CUI program, I, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of, of, of heeding Devin's outstanding advice and going into the DOD CUI uh, webpage uh, for your information. Uh, yeah, it, for kind of point of comparison, we're, we're like uh, the beginning of our sophomore year of high school, uh, and the NARA page for CUI is grad school. Um, we are working very we are focused very much on implementing uh, and aiming at basic full requirements, right? Uh, if you go to the NARA page to, with, with aim points pertaining to the DOD program, uh, I think you'll find yourself uh, very confused very quickly uh, over. Yeah, and I don't want to belabor, this is Greg Pannoni, I don't want to belabor, but it is true, we, as Devin points out, we, we do get a fair amount of inquiries uh, in ISU through the mail, electronic mailbox, and we, uh, you know, divert them back to DOD, so, uh, you know, it comes from government and, and industry alike, but if you could uh, just put the word out, uh, whether it be industry through your various MOU groups, 
to, to start with, uh, in most cases, it's going to be DOD and or the DCSA rep, um, but, but not make ISU slash CUI office your first stop because it, it really it, it doesn't do anybody any good because DOD needs to be aware of these issues, and we just have to turn it around to them if we should receive it. That, over. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, anything else on uh, CUI? All right, I think we've got seven minutes left before we lose the, uh, the bridge call. So that said, let's turn quickly to any new business. Does anybody uh, of, of the, the um, committee, uh, the board, have, have any uh, new business they'd like to bring up? All right, hearing none. Um, does anybody, and I'm referring here specifically to DHS, NRC, and DOE, want to update us on, on any of their doings during the, the COVID uh, crisis here? I mean, how are you adjusting to it? Are you adjusting to it fine? Are there any glitches, any problems? Uh, sir, this is Tracy Kendall from DOE. Uh, we had initially mm -hmm. given a COVID update um, at the last NIST patch. Uh, and basically, the secretary has authorized, of course, maximum um, telework flexibility. Um, and he also had issued some guidance um, as it relates to COVID that went out for about six months. And um, some of those things that the secretary had issued um, were extended uh, last month uh, for another six months. So um, we're still continuing on with the things that we're doing from a COVID perspective. Um, and just from a first and, and from a first act perspective, we had, we did adjust some of our reporting requirement timelines and due process uh, actions for clearances. Um, in addition to um, physical security and classification perspective, we adjusted our required inventory, self assessment, and some of the training timelines that we were um, having our contractor partners adhere to. Um, Great. So that's for DOE as it relates to uh, COVID. So really, we're we're pretty much in a, the same status we were as we started in March. You and everyone else, <laughs> I'm afraid. No. But anybody else wish to chime in on that? Hey, Mark. This is a Rob right. Gray DHS here. Yeah, Rob. Uh, yeah, sure. So similar to everyone else, where we we continue to be in a remote work environment. Uh, we really experienced no identifiable impact to, you know, our ability to, uh, you know, continue uh, supporting the industrial security side. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we don't see uh, any lag in, in uh, processing uh, uh, 254s and, and uh, continuing to support, uh, you know, our industry partners. So that, that's about it from us. Great. Okay, great. Okay. Anybody else? All right, hearing no one else, let me wrap this up. Um, all right, our next NISPAC is scheduled for April 14th, 2021. Uh, we're going to be dropping down to two NISPAC meetings a year instead of three, uh, as we've done for the last 10 years or so. We canvassed all the committee members, and that was the uh, consensus that two would uh, would do it. If for some reason two are not sufficient, we'll revisit that. That's not set in stone, but that's what we're going to aim for this, this coming year. Uh, the April meeting undoubtedly will be 100% virtual. I don't see this, this COVID crisis ending until at least uh, late spring, early summer, and that's, that's being optimistic. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll obviously, you know, once we get by the crisis, we will begin to hold meetings in person again at the McGowan uh, Theater. As a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Registry, uh, Register approximately 30 days before the meeting along with uh, our own ISOO blog. So you can always uh, log into to our, our blogs to probably get the latest, latest information. All right, uh, before I adjourn, is there anything uh, anybody else would like to say, comment on, or bring to our attention before I put the gavel down on a meeting with three minutes left? All right, hearing none, I am going to adjourn this meeting and wish you all a uh, happy holiday season. So thank you very much for your patience as we 
struggle in, with this uh, technology that we've got. But uh, again, I think the, the meeting went uh, went very well, and I appreciate all your uh, your help and uh, cooperation. Okay, that's it. Goodbye.